Peter King, the Monday morning quarterback, MMQB, and uh, Football Night in America is Peter King, Sports Illustrated's Peter King. Pete, I've seen Paulie mad before. I've never seen him this angry when he read the Monday morning quarterback that you spent time at the cabin with J.J. Watt. And Paulie, yeah. and Paulie was very, very disappointed. He didn't get invited before you did. So Why? Is he a J.J. Watt guy? Oh, my gosh. Oh. Now, now you're just being dismissive, Peter. You're a great reporter. You should know better than that. Peter, I thought we were tight. He loves J.J. Watt. They, uh, they exchange pleasantries on uh, social media. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. He's, uh, he's got quite a place. To say that's a log cabin <laughs> is like saying uh, a Motel 6 is a Ritz or something. Uh, it's uh, quite a little log cabin he's got there. Okay, but he did talk about all of his injuries. The The column was about J.J. Watt with his injuries and how long he's going to play. And, and didn't he sort of put a two- or three-year window here if it kind of continues, you know, to be banged up the way he's been banged up? Is that how it was kind of uh, framed? No, I mean, he just said, in essence, that, um, you know, he doesn't know what he's going to do. But what he said, I I said, look, here's your chance. Clarify what exactly you think you're going to do, okay? And so, because I've read a bunch of different things, he's he's going to retire uh, way before his time. He might retire. So I just said, "What what's the truth?" And he said, "I have no idea what it's going to be." Hmm. And that it, I'm not. He said, "I'm not saying it's not going to be two, three, or four years." But he said, "I'm, I'm also said it's. I, I'm not saying it's going to be nine or ten years either." Um, I, I mean. I think his point originally and his point now is that um, he's going to play as long as he can play without a lot of pain and as long as it's still fun. And I think that that's, I mean, I think this is a huge year for J.J. Watt, a lot more important than a lot of people think because. Last year was a disaster physically. He worked himself into being tremendously hurt, and so will he be? Will he be as hurt this year, or was that a fluke thing last year where he had a back injury, a broken hand, and he practically tore his groin muscle from the bone? So this is going to be huge if he has another year like that where every week. It's a battle just to be able to get out on the practice field on Thursday. Uh, I mean, who knows? I think that would change his mind. Talking to Peter King from the MMQB.com. I just saw this on the uh, NFL Network. Uh, The Browns are basically saying you want to come in and get the number two pick. It's up for grabs here. Uh, What's that say to you about Cleveland and anybody who's willing to go up? Uh, Well, I I think, first of all, it's true. Um, they're very much open for business. Uh, word out of that building is that they were very interested in Jared Goff, and I think it's likely that Goff goes number one to the Rams, but not certain, likely. Hmm. Um, but uh, the, the Browns, one of the reasons why this is, Dan, is that the Browns want to give Robert Griffin III a real chance to be their quarterback. And I think there are those inside the building who feel if we take Goff or Wentz here, we're telling Griffin that basically uh, he's not the quarterback of the future. And I don't think they want to do that yet. Um, So I I think this is a very tough position for the Browns to be in. And that's why it would be smarter if they truly are going to give Griffin a chance. It would be smarter for them to move down and aggregate some picks and maybe even, uh, you know, trade to get younger to try to get more picks. I mean, I would not be shocked. I mean, I wouldn't be. I, I don't necessarily expect it. I wouldn't be shocked to see them talk to somebody about Joe Thomas. Uh, so I, I think the Browns are a very fluid team going into d- the draft. Yeah, I, I would trade that pick and trade down. I'd do what Tennessee did because you need a whole lot of help there. And and if you really believe in RG3, then give him a chance. Unless you're sold and you say, look, if we get Carson Wentz, we got our quarterback for the future. I don't know if the Cleveland Browns can say that. 
I don't think they can, I don't know that they can say it either, but I think the key thing is, Dan, Hugh Jackson did not sign Robert Griffin III because he was saying, okay, this will be our guy for the next year while the guy who we draft, while we get him ready to play 2017. No. Hugh Jackson signed Robert Griffin III because he thought he has a more, he has a legitimate chance, not just a 20% chance a legitimate chance to be a very good quarterback in the NFL. And you know that, that Hugh Jackson loves, you know, he's kind of like a player in that way. He loves when people say you can't do it or that's a dumb idea. So I, I think this is very much in Hugh's character to sign the lesser guy and to say we're going to make a great player out of this guy. We had Les Snead on the Rams GM yesterday, and he, he said, look, we know who we're taking uh, when I pressed him on it. But he's still going to, I guess, continue to have the facade here of he's not quite sure if you're going to have both those quarterbacks in, work them out or have dinner with them. Why are the Rams being sort of clandestine or secretive about this? If they, I talk, well, I've talked to Snead twice at length for a story I'm doing tomorrow. Uh, at the MMQB about how exactly this trade came about and uh, this sort of tick-tock about how it ended. Uh, and it's, it's, very, it's a very interesting story. But I, I, I basically asked them a lot of, that, of those questions. And, and also, you know, this, this thing that, uh, you know, just because you need a quarterback, did you make your grades go up that high? so that these guys would justify the pick. And I think there's two things. Number one, I think the Rams believe that Wentz and Goff have grades that are very close to Mariota and Winston last year. So Hmm. they do not believe that they're forcing this. They believe that at least one of those guys, and he said to me, he said, I'm convinced that both of those guys uh, will be successful in the NFL. So, you know, who knows? But they had dinner last night with Carson Wentz in California, and they're going to see golf this week. So uh, why are they doing it? I guess I would look at it this way, Dan. If you had a franchise-changing decision and you had just traded six draft choices in the top three rounds of the next two drafts, six picks, and you had two weeks before the draft to scope everything out, why wouldn't you want to, even if in your building it's golf 55-45, let's just say, and I don't even know whether that's accurate, but if it is, then don't you think it's, it's, it's a good idea instead of just going blindly into golf that they uh, investigate both? What do they have to lose? Yeah, but what are you going to get out of a dinner conversation? That, Who they, knows? They already said they well, fell I in mean, love. I, I, don't, I don't know, but... You know, you can either do this. You've got two weeks before the draft. You can either sit in your cocoon and say, I know who we're going to pick. There's no doubt about it, and blah, blah, blah. Or you can uh, investigate both guys, and who knows? Maybe something comes of this investigation. Dan, I don't think they're going to change their mind either, but this is probably the way I would do it, too. I would, I would take the time and investigate both guys fully. Which dinner conversation would you uh, prefer to be a part of, Carson Wentz or Jared Goff with the Rams? Uh, Wentz, I think, is a real fascinating guy. He's from Bismarck, North Dakota. In every conversation he has, he says he's going to live in in North Dakota when he's out of football. And yet, and you always think, well, this is going to be too big for him. You know, and everybody I've talked to about Wentz in the NFL who's met him and spent time with him, I mean, everybody says, wow, we think that he's going to be okay with being a billboard in, uh, in Sunset Boulevard or Cleveland or Dallas or whatever, that he's going to handle that aspect of it just fine. And, look, I've only spent 45 minutes with the guy, so I can't, I can't pretend like I know him, but he's... He's one of those guys you'd say, well, he played at North Dakota State. I mean, how in the world can, can people feel like this guy can make the transition? 
And I remember, Dan, at the Combine, the day he worked out, I talked to the governor of North Dakota. <laughs> and uh, the governor of North Dakota basically, he said to me that day, he said, man, everybody in the state, our buttons are just popping here. Like, he's the biggest hero. Yeah. He might be the biggest hero to come out of that state since Roger Maris. And so, you know, in sports. So, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think that he's had, in his way, he's had a bunch of pressure on him already. Pete, good to visit with you. I know it's a busy time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a million, Dan. All the best. The Dan Patrick Show, weekday mornings on Audience.